Okay, so this is the first kind of physics side of things that we we've put the muscle harness now. We're just going to deal with mechanics. Um, so the first thing we're going to cover is the idea of particle motion. And the first thing in that really we have to kind of confront is the idea that a lot of physics is based off of idealizations and assumptions. So, and approximations as well. So in this case, we're going to be taking a look at a point particle. Now the idea of a point particle that just occupies one single point in the position, in the position space is impossible, right? There's, if a, a particle was really the size of just one point, it would have an infinite amount of um, density because it has zero volume and any degree of mass, or any degree of mass. So this doesn't really exist, right? It can't exist in the real world, but it doesn't really matter for our in, uh, intents and purposes. We are going to model the motion of a particle um, in this way, and that's fine because we're not um, dealing with a scale that, that would matter. But if you were to model um, the flow or the movement of a ball, you couldn't really approximate it too well as a point particle because it has surface area, it has volume, etc. But we're not going to deal with that for just yet. Um, so when we have uh, our point particle, we can describe it, its position as a vector because it has a direction, a certain like, direction where it is from our origin, and it has a magnitude, how actually far away it is. And we'll call this vector or, and it's made out of different components. So it, it'll be made out of an x component, a y component, and a z component. And most often, these will come with time dependencies, right? And these will all be functions of time because the, the point or the particle will move with respect to time in any of these directions. Any or all of these directions, I should say. Um, so then our job kind of studying mechanics is, is taking as much information as we have about the situation and any initial conditions we might have and trying to get this uh, R of T, we call, um, so we can figure out where the um, point is or the particle is at any given time. Yeah, so when we have uh, this equation um, of, uh, of time, describing the position of a, of a particle, we can try and take its derivative, right? We'll, but we'll see if what we can do if we take the derivative with respect to time of the position. So we'll get x prime of t, y prime of t, and z prime of t. These derivatives carry into vectors in this way. Um, and if we think about how, okay, we think what a derivative is. It's how much a function, so in this case the position, of a particle is changing with respect to a variable, in this case the time. So if we think about what it's like if we have position uh, changing with depend depending on time, and that kind of makes sense as the velocity, right? So we define this as the velocity vector v. Um, and where if we had the velocity and we took the magnitude of that, it would just be the normal speed that we'd know, the scalar speed in general. Um, so now we're going to move on to some example with this kind of in mind. And, and obviously, you can take more and more derivatives of this as well. But we move on to an example of, let's say we have z of t equal to call it z naught plus um, oh, I see how I'm sorry. Z naught plus V Z and naught T minus a half G T squared will have Y of T equal to some constant A and or actually B and X of T equal to some constant A. Where A, where A, B, and G are just some constant real numbers. For it doesn't really matter for for our purpose now. So now we have our OR vector, and we can see what we can do with it to try and find A, B, G, etc. So we can take let's take the derivative of all of these. And um, so if we have our OR vector, and we take its 
derivative will have RV, which is equal to Z of T, taking the derivative, this Z naught thing here will cancel, or will, will go away because it has no T dependence. This T here will go, and we'll be left with V Z naught, and we'll be able to apply the uh, power rule to this. So then we'll get, and likewise in X and Y, because A and B don't have any Z dependence because they're constants, they go as well. So then we'll have uh, 0, 0, and VZ naught minus GT. Okay, so now we have our velocity, which tells us how our position changes. What happens if we do that, like I said, and we take another derivative? We'll see how the velocity changes. So thinking back to knowledge you might have about physics beforehand, if we see how much the velocity changes in res with respect to time, that's really just the acceleration, right? So we can take this um, this derivative again, and we'll get that v prime t is equal to a, the acceleration vector, which is still a vector, um, and we'll get 0, 0, because again, zeros are just constant. They don't affect anything. Vz, or Vz naught here, will go because it's constant, and we can get rid of the t as well. So we end up with just minus g. So we can see now that we have the r vector, which is constant in the x, y direction, and then we'll have plus not t minus a half gt squared. Um, then we have our v vector, which is 0, 0, vz naught minus gt, and our acceleration vector, which is 0, 0, and minus g. Right. Um, so now when we, we consider this, take a step back and consider it. So we know that the position of um, our particle at, at one time will, will be this function or um, evaluate it at any given time t. Now, if we have a look at this, if we vary t from one, uh, say from one to two or any value, the x and the y coordinates won't change, right? So we have A and B are just constant. They will never change. And that's why we have here the velocity of the particle in the x and y directions are zero. So we'll see how much the z component changes. And that is our velocity here, vz naught minus gt. And then our acceleration, um, which is the derivative, the derivative of v, velocity, is minus g, right? So the fact that there's no acceleration in the xy coordinates and there's no velocity in the xy uh, direction either means that this position uh, will never change. This particle's uh, component, the x and y coordinates, will stay constant forever. So yeah, the particle will be staying constant in the x and y coordinates. And then it will change in the z coordinates. The position of z will uh, change, change in this way, as we've denoted in v, and v will change in a. Taking a step back and kind of visualizing this, we can imagine that the particle is moving only along z um, by this much here. So this is the speed at which it's going. But it's slowing down because this minus here and will eventually come to rest. Technically, it will then continue moving um, as if it was going backwards. But this is where kind of initial conditions and physical intuition will come into, come into play a bit more. So yeah, this is our kind of good example of linear motion, uniform um, I have a uniform linear motion. Okay, so with that example done of uniform uh, linear motion, we move on to one of the most used forms of motion in physics, and that's called um, simple harmonic motion. It, it it's models particles oscillating along one axis. Uh, this is used everywhere in physics. It's, it's um, the perfect model to approximate a lot of things on. So if we had, um, say, a particle moving along the 
x direction only. So we can we can not worry about the y and z um, direction. We only worry about the x direction. Okay, so when we have our simple harmonic motion and we want to uh, we want to kind of model that. I'll, I'll kind of I'll kind of give you an idea of how we do that. So if we have it's only moving along the x-axis, so we have x of t. We can give it as a sine times omega t. It can be sine or cosine, but we'll deal with sine for now. And these a and omega, these a and omega are just real numbers. They represent different quantities, physical quantities. The a stands for the amplitude. So if we have, um, say, one idea is like a spring, uh, a particle moving along a spring, so it'll go bounce up and down. The amplitude kind of tells us how far it's going in either direction. And then omega is the angular frequency. It tells us how fast it's going. And so we have this function here. We want to find, say, the velocity of it. So v of t, we'll know, is the same as x prime of t, which, uh, so when we take the derivative of this, we use the chain rule here in the argument, and we get omega times the derivative of the entire uh, function. So that's a again times the co cosine of omega t. And so now we have our velocity. We can do this again to find our acceleration. So the acceleration function, respect to t, is the same as the velocity differentiated. So again, we bring omega out, and this time cosine will go to minus sine. So we'll have minus omega squared a sine omega t. Um, so when we think about minima, maxima, etc., um, and how these kind of how these functions relate to each other, we can see that there's actually a phase difference. Now, what this means is that if we were to graph um, x, b, and a on the same actually on the same um, plane, so if we had here, we would have um, the x function moving like this. So we have x of t here where we can give this as a and down here as minus a. We can then get the um, velocity function will look something like this, v of t. Um, now it's going to be a little bit scaled as well because you'll have omega times a up here, but if we just take it as omega equal to one, they'll, make, they'll match up pretty nicely. And then finally, you'll have the acceleration, which is pretty much the opposite or reflected version of the position. So you can see it's a bit messy here, but we can see how all these are kind of um, inter interconnected. And if we were to play, if we were to move on with these, we'd see that um, there's what's called a, a phase difference. So the velocity function, right, is about pi over two units of t shifted backwards. Um, and the acceleration function here, the purple one here, is about pi units shifted backwards from the x function. Um, so this is what we, what we mean by a phase shift. This is really useful in well, this is really we understand more on like an optics point of view, not too much here. Um, yeah, so coming from like a minimum maximum idea is where where sines and cosines are at minimum and maximum. Minima and maxima are usually at multiples of pi over two. So that kind of becomes a little bit more awkward when you have omegas in it, but not too much. Um, not too much really anyway. So when a, a sine omega t is at a maximum. So if we have the maximum value of the x function, that will give us a at, um, at omega t equal to pi over 2 
for instance, this is the first one, that these will periodically come up because straight functions are periodic in that way. But if we then have a look at what this means for our velocity and acceleration functions, if a cosine is evaluated at omega t, or sorry, at pi over two rather, it'll go to zero, which means this whole velocity will go to zero, which means that at its maximum, so if, if it's fully extended, that means the velocity is not moving at all. It's, its velocity is zero. If we look at the acceleration of that, however, noting that the acceleration is really just minus omega squared times the position function, which is a neat little, um, neat little feature of, uh, of these, that we'll, we'll see that when this is at, when the acceleration function is at a maximum, sorry, rather when the uh, position function is at a maximum, the acceleration function is also at a, is at a minimum, or really it's a maximum in the negative direction, um, in that it's being pulled back with the most amount of um, force or acceleration. Yeah, it's being pulled back with the most amount of force towards the center. So that's how we, we can use this information and see how it, um, how it models the system or how a system will develop. So the same way if we take the maximum, uh, the max value of the velocity function, this will give us that, um, this will, sorry, this will give us that omega t is equal to, say zero is the first one. Zero, um, zero will give us, yeah, is the kind of first one we'll see, and again, it repeats every two pi. Um, oh, well, it technically repeats every pi. Um, and if we evaluate um, the position function at zero, we'll see that it's that sine, sine of when omega t is equal to zero, sine of zero will go to zero, and the whole position will go to zero. This means that when we define our spring, for instance, um, it'll oscillate, say, yes, yeah, so if we have like a spring like this, and we can superimpose this on such that here is minus a, this is the furthest down it goes, this is a, the furthest up it goes, and the center point here at zero where it starts. Um, at a, the velocity will be zero, positions are the maximum, and the acceleration of the force, uh, as we'll show later, is pulling it down towards the center the most. When it's at minus a, the position, um, the position at a maximum, the, 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 well, the magnitude of the position is at a maximum. The velocity, again, is gonna be equal to zero. It's stopped moving at the very precise moment or second that it's touching its maximum position. And then the acceleration is pulling it back up to the center. At, when um, omega t is equal to zero, so we have the center here, and the, posi the position will be, um, sorry, yes, the position will be equal to zero, and so it's at its base level. It's at where it was at the beginning, but the, the velocity vector will be on its fastest. It's, it's, it's at its mag magnitude, or its magnitude is at a maximum. And so it's going the fastest when it reaches this instance. So this is kind of the cool thing that we can we can exacerbate, or we can see just by giving uh, a function here for a, a particle to follow, which intuitively makes sense. Uh, we can kind of see how this would model a uh, particle moving back and forth along, oscillating along one axis. So by taking this, we can exacerbate all of these different things um, and seeing how oh, the particle would move without even seeing the particle itself, without having to see it in the real world. Okay, so for this next part in motion, we're gonna be talking about motion in a circle. So let's imagine we have our particle on a 2D plane like that, your normal XY Cartesian plane, and it's moving about counterclockwise in a circle, something like that, at radius R. So 
to model this, because we're not dealing with a particle on one uh, axis anymore, not like when we had our simple harmonic motion, we need two equations. Now, because we have an x-coordinate and a y-coordinate, it's a good guess that we're just gonna need two equations, one to model x and one to model y, uh, being parameterized by time. So, if we were to take one random location, so let's say we had our particle at this point in the circle, right? So the position vector, so it's called, well, we can call that, say, the, or, um, the or vector here, the position vector. We'll be making an angle theta with the x-axis and its magnitude of or or magnitude of or capital being the radius of the circle. So again, like when we were doing our uh, trigonometry back towards the start, if we wanted to find the x component of this uh, position vector here, we need only look down at its projection onto the x-axis, which we'll know is or cos theta, and likewise to find the y um, component of the R vector, we need only look at R sine theta. And so now we have some functions relating to X and Y. So we have some function X, which is somewhat related to R cos theta, and some function Y, which is related to R sine theta. And the question is, how does theta work? Well, when we're moving um, our particle about this circle, or around this circle, it's not moving radially, right? Its radius is never actually changing. And so the only thing we have um, actually changing when the recordance to time is theta, the angle here. Uh, so it will start off, if we put it here, it'll start off with theta equal to zero, and then move up to theta equal to pi over two, and pi, and so on. Um, so really we have theta, so if we were to say x and y as functions of time, really what this means is this or cos theta, where theta is some function of time. So now we're trying to deal with how to find theta. What describes theta? Well, no, it has some relation to time, so some linear relation to time because it's moving if we say it's at, moving at a um, constant speed. And this is where we come back to what we were dealing with before with omega, or the angular frequency, which will tell us the speed. So if we set there theta of t equal to omega t, we find what we're looking for, which is our, um, which is really our same equations that we had for simple harmonic motion, or similar equations. So that means we can write our or vector here as or cos omega t and or sine omega t, like so. And then doing what we've been doing for the past few examples, we take our uh, time derivative of, with respect to, or time derivative of the or vector, so that's how we get our velocity, we get uh, minus omega or cos uh, omega t, or sorry, omega or sine omega t, and omega or cos omega t. And then finally, if we take the time derivative again, we get our acceleration vector, which means we get minus omega squared or cos omega t and minus omega squared or sine omega t. Which, if we look back at our original or vector, means we can write the acceleration in relation to the or vector as um, minus omega squared x of t and minus omega squared y of t. So when we're dealing with vectors in this way, and um, we, we have a constant out front of uh, both terms, 
we can factorize it and bring it outside of the vector, like we would for um, different different polynomials or your, your normal mathematical expressions. So we can therefore write the acceleration vector as minus omega squared times the position vector. Now what does this mean coming from a, a kind of intuitive point of view? What does this actually mean when we think of our uh, particle going around in a circle? Well, it means that um, whenever, wherever a particle is on this circle, so if we have a particle, say, down here, its position vector, or it's going to be pushing outside, um, or its position vector is going to be pushing outside, showing exactly where on the circle our particle is. And then we'll have an acceleration vector pointing in the direct opposite way. So it's pushing towards the center of the circle. And this will become a lot um, more useful and uh, it kind of explains a lot more physical phenomena when we look at forces and that sort of thing later on. But even for now, when you think of um, a body moving around in a circle, you can imagine its acceleration actually pulling it inwards no matter where it is. And so then when we look at our um, velocity, it'll actually be kind of tangent to the circle. So at this point here, it'll be tangent just going out. And so no matter where at the circle is, no matter where on the circle uh, the particle is, its position vector is showing where it is, its acceleration vector is pulling it back towards the center, and its velocity vector is just tangent to the circle at that point. And one way we can see how we can tell that the velocity vector is definitely perpendicular or orthogonal to the position vector here is by using the tools that we've built up in our uh, learning of vectors. So if you remember our dot product or our scalar product shows us in some, it shows us how the vectors will project onto each other. So we had a, if we had a v dot w, that would be the absolute magnitude, the magnitude of v, magnitude of w times cosine of theta, so the um, angle between the two vectors. So when we have our theta here, and these two, um, these two vectors are going to be uh, parallel to or perpendicular to each other. We can say that the angle between them here is a right angle, or pi, pi over two radians. And from our knowledge of the cosine function, when theta is equal to pi over two, for instance, the cosine will go to zero. So when two uh, when two vectors are power or perpendicular to each other, their coast, the angle between them would be pi over two radians, and so the cosine function here will go to zero, which means their entire dot product must be zero. So that's how we can prove orthogonality between two vectors in 2D or 3D space. Um, so if we have our, now that we have this to go by, let's show that the position vector and the velocity vector are indeed orthogonal to each other. So that means we're going to have the r vector dotted with the velocity vector. Now we could try and do this, use our magnitude and angle, but we're trying to show that these are pi over two radians, right? So we can't assume that they are pi, pi over two radians, and so we can't use this. We'll use our other notation for it, which was that it's the sum over i of or i times vi. So in this case, we have or one is or cos theta, or or cos omega t, and our v1 is minus omega or sine omega t. And then we sum this with or two, which is or sine omega t plus omega or cos omega t, or rather multiplied by omega or cos 
omega g. And so our first line here will go to minus omega or squared sine omega t cos omega t. And our second line here will go to omega squared, sorry, um, omega or squared sine omega t cos omega t. And we'll see that these two are in fact the same until so we'll cancel, leaving us with zero. And because our magnitudes aren't, uh, aren't zero, because if we have um, the OR vector here, uh, the magnitude of this would be OR. And so if the radius is not zero, and same for the velocity, as long as omega and OR aren't zero, our magnitudes here can't be zero, and therefore our cosine must be zero, which happens when only when the vectors are perpendicular to each other. So that's how we know for a fact that the uh, velocity vector and the position vector are orthogonal to each other. And because we know that the um, acceleration vector and the position vector are perpendicular or collinear to each other, given the fact that they just go in opposite directions and are scaled by a certain amount, we also know that the acceleration vector and the velocity vector are perpendicular to each other. And that will kind of conclude our first process of motion.